We are currently studying in the book of Revelation today. We hopefully we'll finish up chapter 21. So if you could turn to chapter 21, we would appreciate it. Um, we, uh, we do realize that when it comes to the scripture, there are a lot of opinions about this and that and the other. Uh, whether it becomes, whether they're doctrinal issues or not, we by nature have, we develop opinions. It's part of our soul. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And we uh, see things differently because we are different individuals. We have to be on guard, however, as believers, that we distinguish between opinion and biblical fact. I try when we're teaching up here, when we're, when we're discussing these scriptures, if it's my opinion, I try to tell you that. <laughs> this is just Sandy's idea, Sandy's opinion and um, the opinions of others. Some things we can say, thus saith the Lord. If you have ever been in a discussion with anyone on biblical things, you know that there are those who have differing <laughs> opinions. As someone presents their opinion to you, you want to always ask, what does the Bible say about that? If someone has a bunch of verses and they'll say, the Bible says this, 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 this. <clears throat> the more evidence that they present, the more valid their argument is. Even if it's just one or two references, uh, taken within its context, that is what holds water, is biblical documentation. Um, I don't want to teach anything that I can't back up in that way, and you hold me to it, right? Yes, okay. Anyway. With that introduction, I want us to review. Last week, we began chapter 21. And chapter 21, when we got to verse 6, we said that that basically ended the chronology that was started at the beginning of the book. It gives you a whole lot of things that happened in Revelation, mostly during this time right here, this seven year tribulation period, a, a lot of that is in, uh, consumes the bulk of, uh, or the majority of the book of Revelation. Then we have the day of the Lord, uh, the return of Christ, the millennium, we have the great white throne judgment, and after that, when the new heavens and the new earth are there, Basically, that's the end of that chronology. And what we have following is just other details. Now, we talked about the new heaven and the new earth last week. And we also mentioned that he makes all things new in verse, in verse uh, uh, what was it? Verse 5. He said, I make all things new. We talked about that. It says the former things are passed away. Some of those former things are pain, suffering, sorrow, tears. Remember that at this point we have witnessed the great white throne judgment. We have seen people we know who refuse to accept Christ as their Savior. And we weep for them. But it says that God wipes away all tears, verse 4, from our eyes. And 
when that happens, we will see them in a different light as God sees them. But it is true that that song, No Tears in Heaven, is not a biblical song because there will be tears. How many of you were here for the pastor's sermon Sunday night? I believe he hit on that, did he not? Yes. And uh, that is true. God will, however, wipe all tears from our eyes. Can, can you explain that a little? Because if there's no sadness in heaven, if, if there are no sorrows, why will we be crying? Because we have seen people we love in this life whom we were concerned about who rejected Christ will be sentenced at the great white throne judgment. And that will affect us. But it's not the whole time. I mean, is that just for a period of time? It's just after, just after that judgment is done. God wipes the tears from our eyes. But we're not going to be crying the whole time we're up there. No. <laughs> we wouldn't if God wipes the tears away, then they're gone. Okay? Everybody, I mean, we pretty much got that concept. Um, the circle then is complete. Genesis to Revelation. When God said in verse 6, it is done. Uh, what God started in Genesis, he finishes in Revelation. He had the first heaven and the first earth in Genesis 1-1. In uh, Revelation 21-1, he's got the new heaven and the new earth. That cycle is complete. We will see that in the Garden of Eden was the tree of life. We're going to see that again, the tree of life. So what started there will, will be in, in eternity. You remember after uh, Adam and Eve left the garden and the boys Cain and Abel had their thing where, where they were to bring sacrifices to the Lord. Abel brought a lamb sacrifice. And in eternity, we will refer to our husband, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God. Uh, so he, uh, the Lamb is, was in Genesis, the Lamb was, is in Revelation. So you have this circle that's complete. By the way, the Bible was written over a period of about 1,500 years with 40 or more writers. And that's the book that we have sitting in front of us right now. What other book can you say has those credits to it? No other book. This is God's book. Now I know we walk by faith and not by sight, but just seeing this book, you are seeing a miracle, literally, in the book, the Holy Bible, which we have, which God has given to us. So anyway, <clears throat> today we're going to look at, guess what, the new Jerusalem. As we get into that, we find that in verses 7 through 27. So uh, let's, uh, uh, actually verse 9 through 27, I should have, because we took 7, 8, and 9 last week, so uh, 7 and 8 last week, so let's start at verse 9. My mistake up there. <clears throat> and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, that, of course, he's referring to things that happened right over here, right before Christ came back during the tribulation. <clears throat> and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show you, show thee 
the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. This is what John sees. He's in eternity, so he can see it. For us, this is a future event. So when he was on earth, this event was future. The rapture is a future event. And yet John, because he was carried in the Spirit into the presence of God in eternity, was able to see all these events as God can see all these events because he dwells in an environment where time does not exist. He sees this holy Jerusalem. Um, that's in contrast with the other Jerusalem that's on earth now. And if you look in, uh, don't, don't turn to it now, but in Revelation chapter 11, uh, it refers to Jerusalem as a city that was like Egypt and like Sodom spiritually. So that's a pretty pretty good slap in the face of what Jerusalem is during, uh, during time. It has had many kings in the past who worshipped Baal and idols and stuff. So that was why uh, he referred to it back as Jerusalem. This city was like Egypt, like Sodom. But this holy Jerusalem, this new one, the new Jerusalem, uh, comes out of heaven and he sees it as holy. No beer cans, no cigarette buds. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no fluoridated water. Uh, no, I mean, it's holy. And we're going to see what it looks like as John describes it. <clears throat> Verse 11, having the glory of God and her life was like unto stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and read this. I hope I get some of the words pronounced correctly. Uh, but as we read this, you'll know that this is the best John could do to describe it. You know? Okay, here it goes. Verse 12, It had a wall, great and high, had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. He had twelve sons, and those were the names that were on these gates as a tribute to them. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. I always found it fascinating that he uses uh, the compass, uh, north, south, east, and west. You need to learn north, south, east, and west. <laughs> Somebody's giving you directions, you say, it is north of here. You need to learn that. You don't need to say, when you come to this, you turn right. <laughs> Learn directions. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't plan on saying that. Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> Verse 14. On the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them was the name, names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Personal opinion? I don't believe Judas was one of those <laughs> named. <laughs> But I believe Paul was one of those named. Yeah. Just my opinion. Yeah. Anyway, uh, verse 15. And he talked with, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. Uh, the city lieth four square. Four square. And the length as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. Furlongs, the length and breadth and the height of it are equal. 
And you say, furlong, nobody uses that term anymore. Yes, they do. You know where it's used? Horse racing. Survey. Survey. Still used, folks. Okay. Um, verse 17, measure the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of man, that is the angel. You know what a cubit is, don't you? 18 inches. I, I did this this week. I set my hand down there and I stuck a yardstick and, you know, that was 18 inches. Now, if Tom did that, that's probably going to be 24 or 5 inches. But, you know, this is kind of an average, I would say. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Uh, verse, 18, uh, verse 18, the building of the wall was jasper. The city was pure gold, like in the clear glass. And the foundations of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Here's where I get in trouble with the, with the words. First foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony. Is that how you say that? Chalcedony. Whatever. The fourth, an emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardis, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophorus, the eleventh adjacent, the twelfth an amethyst. That's interesting. And the gates were twelve pearls. Uh, every several gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Uh, this is how he saw it. Uh, and he's trying to use terms of today or then to describe it, and that's what he saw. That's how he saw it. Um, verse 22, he continues, looks around, and he says, And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Uh, you'll find that in these two chapters, it speaks of uh, the Lord God or God and the Lamb. God and the Lamb. The three places in these last two chapters, those terms are used. God and the Lamb. Interesting. Um, Verse 23, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of, the, of God did lighten it, and Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. No night there. They shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. There shall be, uh, there, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever maketh an abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. He kind of says that last statement. Uh, looking back at this time here, because the guy in charge, the beast, makes abomination <coughs> right here, and the whole time he's telling a bunch of lies. So the abomination and the lie is kind of reflecting back uh, for the benefit of those people who are living here. See? Because when we're gone, and this time is going on, they'll read this and think, oh wow, you know, we got to watch this guy that's telling lies and, and the one that's setting up this abomination. So that's sort of reflective back to them. Anyway, we come across this new Jerusalem, and uh, uh, it, it, this, this is just... You have to use your imagination. You know, there's just no way uh, to see this. Uh, people say, I don't want to read the book. I'm going to wait till the movie comes out. 
Well, then there are others that says the movie in no way conveyed what the book said. I believe this is the case here. There's nothing, no picture, no movie, no whatever you could see that could convey because your mind takes this information and builds its own image in your mind as to how this thing looks. The description of this thing is really indescribable uh, and this is the best we can imagine even, but just just looking at this passage, and we could we could take this thing apart and all, but I think leaving this to our imaginations in some way is really good. Paul saw all of this. He saw exactly what John sees here in Revelation. He saw it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Remember, they took him outside the city and stoned him, left him for dead, which I believe he was. And it said he was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise. And he looked around and saw this. And you can imagine the angels had to really boot him out of there to get him to go back to earth. Uh, from that point on, Paul had a, what would you call it, a death wish. <laughs> he said, for me to live as Christ, but to die is gain, because he saw this. He saw these streets. He saw this place that Christ was preparing. And he welcomed the sword of the executioner because he knew where he was going. And we should look at it just that way. This life is such an insignificant thing in comparison to what God has for us. We go through stuff. We endure stuff. But it's so brief. Even Shakespeare kind of copied from the scriptures in a way where he said, it's like a player that struts and frets his hour on the stage and then is heard no more. It's just a whoosh and it's gone. That's what our life is. When we were four and five years old, time just drug along. And we waited forever for Christmas to come. You know, like, wow, it's never going to get here. Or, in my case, summer vacation, you know, it's never going to get here. But after we get to our age now, it just, whew, it goes by fast. I keep track of time by looking at my pills. Oh, it's Sunday. <laughs> Again, wow, I was just having my Sunday pills just moments ago. Whew. Anyway, Paul was not allowed to write it about it. But he thought about it, I guarantee. John, however, saw it and was commanded to write what he saw. And the book of Revelation is, is worth the reading, let me tell you. It's worth the studying. Even at the beginning of the book, there's a blessing for those who read this particular book. So don't avoid it, study it, enjoy it. Okay, in verse 9 and 10, we see the bride, the Lamb's wife, and the holy Jerusalem. The woman and the city are associated together. When he says, come see the bride, the Lamb's wife, and he shows you the city. <clears throat> Uh, this is interesting that we will always be associated with the New Jerusalem. Always. That is our destination eternally. Uh, Satan always had a counterfeit, right? He had a woman that was a city. 
Revelation 17 and 18, mystery, Babylon the Great. That city, that woman, that harlot was his bride, his, and it was associated with the woman in the city. Christ died for us. Satan's forces will kill us. You'll see that as we studied that before. Okay, let's go back to uh, this. It is the home of Christ's wife. The eternal home of Christ's wife. Which we are. Now, The, the, uh, she was his spouse in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. He espouses. What, what does it mean to be espoused? A wife. That's a promise, is it not? It's an engagement. It's a commitment. Uh, and so, Christ committed to us, see, he espoused us, and he will keep his commitments. We see that uh, we will be brought to the Father's house in First Thessalonians four. That's that red arrow right over there. The rapture. We will be brought to the Father's house. We studied earlier there would be guests, relatives, people, ceremony, wedding supper, all of that. In Revelation 19, verse 7 and 9, we are made ready and we are married to the Lamb. And now in Revelation 21, verse 9, we are spoken of as the Lamb's wife. So we have gone through this process and now we will uh, at this point are referred to as the wife of the Lamb. Now more about the Jerusalem. This home of Christ's wife these are church age saints which are over here. Church age saints and the church age saints is that is a group that began with those who have believed in Christ since his resurrection until the rapture. Anyone who is a believer during this time is a member of Christ's church. Okay? Now, those who died before Christ was resurrected, see, were not. But all of those in Christ from that time are the members of the body of Christ and are the church age saints. Note that this new Jerusalem is the house that Jesus made. John 14, 1 through 3 uh, says, uh, yeah, let not yourself heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Let you believe in God. Believe also in, me. in my Father's house many are many mansions. Don't let them tell you it's many houses. It's many mansions. I got a house here. I like it. But it is not a mansion. <coughs> Although my wife treats it as such and not. Uh, I, I, I probably need to refer to that as my mansion. <laughs> Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Okay? So this is the house that Jesus made. Also in 1 Corinthians 2.9 uh, speaks of this. How many of you remember what they used to call Yankee Stadium? The house that Ruth built. <laughs> well, this is the house that Jesus is making. It's going to be better. Now, when you said the rapture happened and 
we're brought to the Father's house. Mm -hmm. Is that a different house, or is that the house? Well, the Father's house speaks of where He dwells. Mm -hmm. And He dwells in eternity. That's the dwelling place. That is the habitation of God. That is where He dwells, His house. Okay, that's a, a, a Jewish thing because when uh, a, a Jewish lady would be married, she was brought to the groom's father's house to be married. Okay, now let's look at the New Jerusalem. We see the dimensions in 16, verse 16. 12,000 furlongs, now furlong is... 660 feet according to the references that I found. Some say it's not that much, but it's got to be a standard. If you figure that, it's 1,500 miles. That is, that's a big place. 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, four square. Now, this gentleman Somebody made a little box that represents the approximate size of the New Jerusalem and just stuck it to a globe to give you an idea of the size of this thing. Note, you have this is the United States here, and most of that kind of falls inside that, that uh, cube there, or underneath that cube. There's also something that you notice about it is that it says it's three-dimensional. It's also 1,500 miles high. Well, that's way beyond the satellites and the atmosphere and the ceiling of most of what we have around here, the planes and all that. So that goes way up. So something is going to be different about the heavens and the earth where the new Jerusalem comes. And by the way, I've got another uh, thing for you here. The dimensions are this, but it also says the wall in verse 17. Uh, if you uh, calculate the 18 inches for the cubits, it comes out to 216 feet tall. Uh, imagine. 216 feet. That's what, a 21 story building? Something like that. The wall is tall. It doesn't give the thickness of the wall. I, I haven't been able to find that. But this is measured according to the measure of the man. That is, of the angel. Do you see that in there? Man, angel. Man, angel. Angels are men. They're not sexless. They're not female. They are men. In Daniel, I figure whether it's seven, eight, or nine, it talks about the man Gabriel. They're men. Okay? So when it speaks of the measure of the man that is of the angel here. Now I've got a few artist conceptions of the New Jerusalem, but I don't want you to say that's how it's going to look. <laughs> it's, it's just beyond description. But these guys sort of had a visualization of it. Uh, uh, the, New, the New Jerusalem, some have pictured it as a cube, like that guy made a little box. Uh, as it's recorded in Revelation 21, 16, it says the height, the length, the breadth are all the same. That means it's as wide as it is deep as it is tall. So because of that, some have pictured it as a cube. And it very well may be. Um, this is one guy's conception of it as a cube with the wall you know, and everything there. Anybody see anything strange about that picture? It's over what? It's over the old Jerusalem. Yeah. And here's the Eastern Gate, which is still closed. We know that that's not going to be true. 
And there's something else right in the middle of that that's not going to be there. <laughs> yeah, the Mosque of Omar is, isn't that what it is, the Mosque of Omar? I forget what the name of that thing, the Nome Rock is not going to be there. Uh, so uh, that's kind of, I understand he just had the picture and he did the graphics. So some picture the New Jerusalem as a cube. Some pictures, including uh, some authors like Larkin, have pictured it as a pyramid where it's 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles this way, and a pyramid that goes up, which is 1,500 miles tall. I don't know if that's how it's going to be. Uh, this one guy pictured it as that. It's not a very good picture. I got another picture here that's a little bit better, but you see the wall, the pearl of the gate, and uh, the, uh, the throne, and you actually see the river that comes and flows out of it. Interesting thing, but uh, again, who knows but John and Paul what this thing really looked like. It could be this. I heard one guy pictured it as a pyramid, but pictured it as two pyramids one that sat on top of the other with the apex of both, one at the bottom, one at the top. I don't know how it came up with that, but <laughs> that, I don't know. Walls are meant to contain, keep things in or out. Any thoughts or opinions on why the wall? Why the wall? Uh -huh. uh, a wall is for security. I, I don't think that we would have any insecure feelings in eternity, but it does say without the wall, in where am I uh, that nobody can come into it that that makes uh, an abomination or a lie. Now it's not like there's a bunch of those people outside beating on the wall trying to get in. It's not what it what it's saying there. But the wall, I don't know. That's a good question to ask the Lord. Why is there a wall? It's got gates, so the gates are open all the time. So I was going to say, you have to have a wall if you want a gate. That's right. I'm going to ask, I'll be sure to ask the Lord that sometime. I'm going to ask him why he allowed mosquitoes to be created. <laughs> no sims. I don't know the purpose. New Jerusalem begs the idea of an old Jerusalem. And the Bible is full of stories about the number of times Jerusalem is destroyed. And that's why there has to be the new one. Even so that it would be impossible. Even when God comes back. I, th I think I think you're right. I, I there's, there's a lot of reasons why there's a wall, um, but I don't know them all. Let's go on. The New Jerusalem, the details of construction, we saw that. Uh, they're using stuff as building materials that people die for in this life, that sacrifice for their gold and silver. Read James chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, and it says their gold and their silver are cankered. There'll be a time where it doesn't do you any good to have gold and silver. But that's the construction. Billions could live here. If you look at the dimensions of this thing and how many places in that that there could be, Billions could live there. Literally. And you think, well, if this is the church, since the rap since uh, the resurrection to the rapture, that is a finite number of people. And if you say, well, did did a hundred thousand people know the Lord or in any one, whatever. If you, if you start doing math, you'll come out, well, there are 
there, uh, there's not that many people that could fill this city. I want you to keep in mind David. Remember when David, uh, his little son, died? Um, Bathsheba's first son died. And David said, he can come to me, but I will be able to go to him. And from that and other passages, it indicates that those babies and those who are what we call under the age of accountability, who just are too young to understand things, will be with the Lord. Well, think of how many people over the world between the resurrection of Christ and the rapture will have fallen into that category of babies and young children that did not understand or know that will be with him. Look at, look at in America how many Babies have been aborted. Guess what? They will be with the Lord. We're, we don't have time to look at it this morning, but it says here, let me see if I can skip down to it. There's no temple, the sun, there's no light there, but the nations visit in verse 24. Nations visit. Visit. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in it. Do you know that in many countries today, I will say Muslim countries today, there will be many from those countries who will be in this because they died before they were old enough to know this stuff. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Indonesia, Russia, China. All these babies are members of the body of Christ. And the nations of them which will save shall walk in the light of this. We, we know that Assyria will be blessed during this time. Egypt will be blessed during this time. And I'm sure that there's a lot of Jews that would say, wow, Assyria was our enemy. Egypt was our enemy. Babylon was our enemy. Persia was our enemy. And yet, there will be many from those who know the Lord who will be blessed and will, and Israel will be the center of his blessing. Next chapter, there are more details of new heavens and the new earth in that chapter, chapter 22. And there's a lot more we could say about the new Jerusalem. I, I just want to let you read that over and over. Let it sink in. And let you know that I have not seen or ear heard of the wonders that await those that love the Lord. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your promise that you said, if I go away, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Thank you for this great promise. Thank you in advance for our great future with you. Help us to realize that the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace.
Christ. We ask it in your name. Amen.